children are in truth mm -hmm. you know so which means that existence itself is truth Jinan Kodapuli is a researcher of natural cognition. He is interested to lead a Math for Wisdom study group on natural cognition. In rural Kerala, India, he observes, studies, enjoys, and champions the natural creativity of illiterate adults and children, as opposed to the stupor of the literate, rational, miseducated, modern Western mind. Absolutely, because I always feel the whole modern crisis is crisis in cognition, in our formation. Jinan and I met for the first and only time in 2003 in Bangalore at the Development by Design Conference organized by ThinkCycle, a group of MIT Media Lab students. Subsequently, until 2010, he participated in Minchu Sodas, my online laboratory for independent thinkers around the world. After Russia invaded Ukraine, I reached out and asked Jinan to record his vision for our future as part of an effort to encourage global dialogue. That 30-minute talk recorded on March 21, 2023, is a summary of his views on reimagining childhood. I recommend that especially if you would like to join his study group on natural cognition. At the time, Jinan and I also recorded our subsequent conversation, which is mostly my own monologue, where I try to resist and push back on his ideas in a genuine way, but also build bridges to him and his perspective. Most importantly, at the end, he agreed to join our Math for Wisdom discussion group, uh, just as you could join, which now, half a year later, is leading to his study group on natural cognition. Jinan avoids the digital world, so this is a significant accommodation on his part. I also ask him about his relationship with truth. Indeed, at that time, I was just realizing that nobody else at Math for Wisdom shared my passion for absolute truth. For Jinan, truth is direct existence. We live truth. And what is your relationship with truth? Finally, as a Westerner, but more personally, as an independent thinker seeking a shared reality, I felt very challenged by his love of natural cognition because it implied that all of my life, my dreams, my struggles were invested in my own artificial cognition. So I pushed back on that uh, in terms of wondrous wisdom whereby we have uh, not just a natural intuitive mind, as he argues, and a rational literate mind, as he argues, but also a third mind, our consciousness, which governs and binds the other two. So this video is a response to Janan's ideas, in many ways embarrassing for me in that I champion my own ways of thinking. But I am pleased that we may bridge the chasm that separates us and so if you watch his video and you watch this video, that may help you prepare to join in the bridging. I invite you to watch these videos and join us. Uh, and you can find out more at mathforwisdom.com and the description to this video. I am Andrus Kulikauskas. This is Math for Wisdom. I do want to apologize and correct my great mistake. His name is pronounced Jinan. Well, I think I can thank you, you know, for yeah. such a um, well, per perceptive view of the world, you know, and I think this is a, an example of the type of uh, essays we'd like to encourage. And maybe just to say how I uh, tied it together in my mind, you know, uh, if we have this idea of reimagining childhood, yes. then um, that perspective could help us look differently at the conflict. Like you said, can we convert this into something that's just a temporary thing? You know, that these Absolutely. feelings of there, there's legitimate feelings of anger, legitimate feelings of fear. Um, 
but that uh, those could be uh, shaken off, uh, or just maybe that's the wrong word, shaken off, but just simply there could be a new engagement um, which would just come over that. I think just uh, respectfully saying that, um, you know, when people have lost their loved ones or they may lose their homeland, you know, or they may lose um, everything they've known uh, uh, or they may have been lied to, like you say, uh, you know, then um, then they don't feel like children, you know. So what does it take for us to treat each other as children <laughs> and not um, in, 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 a, in a decent way? So that's kind of what I drew from this. I don't know what other people will draw yes, from this. Absolutely, absolutely, absolutely. Because I always feel the whole modern crisis is crisis in cognition, in our formation. Mm -hmm. We have been distorted and we are alienated, you know. So unless we address alienation, as see, it's not some spiritual thing, no, go and meditate and all that. Because come back to childhood, understand children, then I think things can change a lot. That that's what I feel, you know. Okay, so then we end here. Maybe I uh, just uh, above and beyond this, uh, just to uh, ask for a prayer, you know, because we we got to spend this time together, and I think that that yes. is uh, that is actually lovely. It's a for for many good causes and. Could you say a prayer just um, for us? Uh... <laughs> Not really. Actually, you know, see, I have been exploring beauty oh, mm -hmm. as the point of prayer. Okay. Ha. That's because uh, modernity, again, has distorted art into a mental thing. Mm -hmm. Something to think with. I feel you can only access beauty when your mind stops thinking. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You know? So I've been actually doing some explorations on uh, with, I call it awakening aesthetic awareness, mm. where you stop thinking and you connect with beauty. So, and that will happen automatically. The moment you stop thinking, this is like this, you know, when you see something very beautiful, mm. at least for a fraction of a second, you become silent. Suddenly your mind comes over and tell it is beautiful. It is this, it is that, you know, it recollects. But I think the fraction of a second, we are, we become one with that beauty, and if we can, if, uh, and but if we can prolong that a little bit more, you know. So we have to consciously stop engaging the mind, engaging with the world through the mind, you know. Start observing, start observing. So I do this uh, workshops, mm -hmm. uh, you know, uh, which has to do, which is actually to do with, uh, uh, you know, uh, reconnecting your senses with the beauty of the world, you know. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so uh, linguistic. Well, so you have a you have a you have a beautiful beard. I just wanted to say so. That's uh, <laughs> that's a little bit <laughs> disconnected <laughs> from my, yeah. what I want to say. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I interrupted you. What were you saying? Yeah. No, no. So what I mean is that you know, uh, language prayer is not something that I'm able to connect much with. You know. Well, I think it doesn't. I think that's the maybe like you're saying. That's it's not about language. It's about. Um, yeah, yeah. I can say, you know, it's about the depths of our soul. Absolutely, yeah. How yeah. to share that. So yeah. maybe I'll say a prayer. Yeah, um, sure, sure. Absolutely. I just want to thank God, you know, the God of beauty and the God of childhood, you know, the God who loves us more than we love ourselves, uh, who is able to quickly forgive and quickly, you know, unite and ask God to be uh, present around the world and that we learn to... Um, you learn to be children, and that, um, and to ask for, I don't know, his presence that we would we would be able to feel like children that we have a a father, a mother above us, around who we we would have the the ease of living where we could feel that we can be children. Yeah. Thank you, thank you. You know, I love poetry of Rilke. Oh, I find I find Rilke's many many statements coming very close to things that I've been, mm -hmm. you know, exploring. You know, he talks about children. He talks about knowledge. Very beautiful. And that's a very fascinating connection. You know that, uh, like, despite all these things you said about, you know, let's say Western culture, right? But yeah, yeah, but, yeah. But he's a uh, he's some kind of tiny cell within the Western culture, yeah, which absolutely. is you know, it, which is not against the Western culture. I think it's almost no, like no. a consequence of the western culture that you end up with yeah, these people right? yeah, yeah, yeah absolutely. so i think it just 
in a certain yeah. sense, it negates everything you said, but in a certain sense, it supports everything you said. And I think that's yeah, a yeah. divine contradiction, you know, so yeah, we're yeah. wrestling. Maybe uh, personally, um, one of the things, you know, in terms of my growth, um, mm. uh, I have this, uh, you know, you, you didn't want to say laboratory, like you have, a, maybe you call it observatory, you know, like to have yeah. an observatory. But so I have this uh, endeavor, Math for Wisdom, because all my life, I have been developing this internal, discovering, documenting these cognitive frameworks that we live in, this yeah. kind of like mental prison that we yeah. live in. And trying to make sense of the purpose, you know, the 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 the, the issue with that. Uh, and so regarding that, um, I realized that, well, if I can, no one seems to understand or care. But if I could uh, express it in advanced mathematics, you say, hey, it appears here in advanced mm -hmm. mathematics, it would become validated. You know, if people would take it seriously that this is real. Yeah. Because mm -hmm. otherwise it just it's too easy to say it's not real, etc. Or just not care. Uh, so um, what was my point? I wanted to say that. Um, mathematics. Yeah, mathematics. Uh, but the, that was not. Oh, so in terms of my learning process, uh, it's a very small community. We have, you know, mostly me, but then maybe six, seven, eight people were starting to um, engage. And so one of the things I learned, um, which was a little bit shocking to me, but the notion of truth that I have is just so foreign to some of the participants who are most active, let's say. Like, so I believe in absolute truth. You know, I just mm. simply, that just seems to me, I identify, my deepest value in life is living by truth. And so I don't really know maybe what that absolute truth is, but I identify it with so much that if it did not exist, it would just kind of like completely destroy me into shards, you know, and I would, I would just feel like there's really nothing left of me because I've tried so hard all my life. Mm. But it turns out like we have a participant, Kirby, he just can't see those colors. It's like he's colorblind. You know, I can try to talk about that. We've been together for half a year. And I just realized, like, he's deaf to those sounds. You know, he's not, uh, he doesn't see this concept. And so for him, like, truth is, I would say, legacy. You know, like, there are these, there's these, like, he's a fan of Buckminster Fuller. I don't know. But, but you know, there are these certain yeah. people whose ideas need to be kept alive, let's say. Mm -hmm. He's a philosophy uh, student from Princeton many years ago. You know, he's a child high school educator, uh, teaches programming and stuff. So um, he may, I'm sure he's sympathetic to many of your, to, to your, you know, vision. But uh, but the point is, is that he has a different relation with truth. Another participant from New Zealand is John Brett. And he, he keeps talking about truth as metaphor, you know, that we don't really ever know anything, but we have these metaphors. But you see, I kind of challenged him on that because uh, that's not my relationship with truth, you know. But the point, what I started to learn is that there's this landscape of truth. You know, so there's this landscape where people have their relationship with truth uh, strategically based mm -hmm. on, let's say, the deepest value they have, based on kind of like how they deal with the world. But people choose a type of relation. Like, for example, why choose truth as metaphor? Well, you see, there's a lot of advantages in the sense that it allows you to use certain frameworks that other people can say, well, that's just poetry, you see. So you don't have to validate certain things that you'd like to use because you're saying, well, I'm using this metaphorically and everything is used metaphorically. So you can't keep me from using this type of thinking. Let's say, for example, like they have a structure based on the four elements, earth, air, water, a fire, let's say, but they interpret in certain ways, etc. So and they get a lot um, accomplished with that. Like they're able to kind of get uh, people to stop thinking rationally and start thinking emergently and just kind of like letting things how they flow by disconnecting people from this literal nature. Because it's not just about literacy, but it's kind of like about maybe not simply literacy, but literalness. You see that yeah, things yeah. are just the way that they're said to be. Yeah. And yeah. I think this idea to snap out of that and say, no, there's this ambiguity there's this kind of like multiplicity. And um, sometimes you step in, sometimes you step out, you know, there's this kind of back and forth. But to have this mandate that everything is quote unquote literal, uh, that's just mm -hmm. completely um, very one sided and not helpful, destructive, you know, so like, for example, in the case of Russia and Ukraine, that there's only a literal Ukraine or Russia. See, once it's literal, only one person can have it, as opposed to yeah, saying yeah. there's a real Ukraine and it doesn't really matter who owns it. You know, if you live there, it really kind of doesn't matter whose country it is if you mm -hmm. live there, you know, because you are still there, you know, of course. So um, anyway, so something I learned was 
I've tried this with you. I've tried this with people. My, you know, I'm such a rational person in a sense, but you see, I live it in an ambiguous way where I look at it as a way of living by questions. Mm. Because you see this kind of like experiential connection. There's half the mind that does it, but it always gives you one answer. Let's say, you know, it says this is mm -hmm. what, it's like the Google mind, you see. But the idea is that there's another mind that never knows anything. You see, it yeah. has questions. And I think that is the origin of the rational mind. Like, that's why we have two hemispheres, because there's this dialogue between the mm. mind that knows, the mind that does not know. And actually, mm. the control should probably be more emanating from the mind that doesn't know. It's kind of slowing down the rat. It's kind of say, look, you know, give me two answers. Give me three answers. Give me four answers. You see, so you get these different cognitive frameworks, and it's translating all of this kind of like experience. It's saying, look, I want to see this in another form. Right. And yeah. then what the consciousness does is the consciousness takes those two and it aligns them, matches them, and decides which way to go. So that's kind yeah. of like where I've been led. So uh, so the way I would interpret what you've been saying is that that conscious thinking has been somehow abused by neglecting the unconscious, pre-conscious information just kind of saying no just kind of saying we're going to be the answer mind we have the answer yeah. well yeah. it's not that role to have the answers the answer is supposed to come from the other mind you're yeah. supposed to have the question you see so yeah. if you if you reduce everything saying we're going no i have all the answers they're all in the book <laughs> see, i like mm. that kind of thinking becomes very that becomes destructivity i think like that combination but it's the combination yeah. that's the problem it's not really with the conscious mind and the conscious mind should probably be ruling, but really what should be ruling is the consciousness. There's a consciousness that has to decide. And maybe when people wiped out this consciousness and replaced it, says, no, no, there's just the conscious. There's the yeah. three minds, you see. So I'm not saying this is right, but I'm just saying this is where I've been led uh, to. And so anyway, so one of the things I would ask people is, well, what is a question that you don't know the answer to, you see, that we could work on together? Because if you gave me a, I don't want to know what you know, let's say, you know, you just spent yeah, half an yeah. hour to explain what you, what you know, <laughs> but you explained the process, which I think is very important. You know, that was the thing that really, yeah. to say, okay, but let's focus on what we don't know, because that's, we could walk that path together. I've never met a single person in my life who wanted to do that way. Now, I've done that myself, like with thousands of, I've done hundreds of investigations, you see, mm. where I've done that proactively. I kind of think, what's the, how do I, because I think in terms of question, and yeah, I yeah. just see, and it should be kind of natural for a scientist, but like, I just see that people don't have that um, desire. They have this fear or something about thinking, living in terms of questions. But uh, having this not, but see now, I guess just having this strange realization that here I was half a year, you know, with very few people, but like, let's say with Kirby, he has not a concept of absolute truth. And I can talk all I want and say, it just doesn't ex kind of just basically doesn't exist for him, you know, because he, mm. of course he's Princeton trained as a philosopher. So yeah, that has been yeah. killed, you know, many times over. Uh, he has a different relationship with truth. Uh, other people, it's a truth is like perspective, you know, or other people, truth is a hard journey, you see. So yeah. I have a good friend where he, we have good conversations, but like he sees me maybe as a distant star. You see, like, I feel like I'm at the center of some boiling sun, you see, but the fact mm. that someone can see me, you know, we can talk, you see, and he can mm. believe that, well, there could be an absolute truth. There could be me, mm. which is the natural childish way to think, I think, is that, after truth, we don't know, but it could be, you know, mm. it's a possible mm. thing. Uh, but okay. see, that's been erased by a lot of this um, academic, you know, so people who have a bachelor's degree, they still probably believe in absolute truth. But anybody with like a master's or a PhD or anybody with a bachelor's in philosophy has had that completely eradicated. It's very difficult. It's a, it's the last taboo, you know, like yeah. things like, um, anyways, not to go on, but so this idea, oh, I should not be asking people their questions. That's not helpful. I mean, I can ask, but they're not going to want to work on them. But this relationship with truth, like where do they fit in the landscape of truth? What is their relationship? See, I think that then we can find a way to kind of like work as a team because mm. each person's valuable. You see, um, if people have chosen that strategy for a reason and they can tell us things, what it's like to live with that strategy that we don't know. You see, so if we turn it around, saying, tell me what it's like, you know, when you live with truth as metaphor, you see, mm. tell me what it's like when you live as truth as legacy, seeing oh, every person becomes very valuable as an explorer. So maybe, 
to bring it back to you and to ask you, like, what is your relationship with truth or how would you see that? Mm. Actually, uh, I may be looking at it very narrowly, mm -hmm. but uh, still, I always feel that children are in truth. Mm -hmm. You know? So, which means that existence itself is truth. I hope you are... No, I think that's a beautiful, that's just a beautiful answer to see. It makes me feel, first of all, it makes me feel a little bit better because, you know, I listen to you speak and I just feel, uh, you know, where do I sit within all this, right? Because I'm a very literate, you know, I mean, I, mean, I kind of, I don't know how to say, you know, so there's, but I, I listened to it. It was interesting. And then, but to see like my quest to know everything that comes from deep childhood, mm. you see, and I think like my deepest value is living by truth, which is very similar, like what you say, like living in truth. Like, yeah, I think that was my reaction to maybe the adult environment around, you know, was to say I kind of rejected maybe mm -hmm. adulthood in that way, mm -hmm. you know, in the sense that I said, no, I'm going to uh, this world, I think, needs to be clung to. Mm -hmm. And so that's maybe how I clung to this childish vision you know where i am the center of the universe or, or you know whatever whatever it is but these type of childish thinking like which could be taking place in the womb let's say or in the yeah. uh you know so um but i experience not so much experientially on the outside but experientially on the inside so imagine like a child in the womb they would contemplate things like mm. everything you know or like um different perspectives or like you know i mean what do you do when you when you just have a different relationship with you know, this ability to have poverty of stimulus, you know, and kind of like to create your own stimulus, so to speak, to be studying your own. I think that the, I don't want to say poverty of stimulus, but still like in the womb, this there's a there's this context for self-stimulation. And I think that that's a very childish like so we didn't have too many toys, you know, growing up. Uh, we didn't have uh, much attention from our parents in a certain way. Like I can kind of understand like we. It always seemed a little bit like we saw this option, like other children had lots of toys, let's say. Other children had, but but that it was something healthy about this, that we need to occupy ourselves. So mm -hmm. this idea of being an independent thinker, you know, where you have to kind of stimulate your own self, you have to come up with your own things to do, you know, and that's just the way life is. I don't know if that's, uh, yeah. I, I don't know if that relates, but I, that's how I relate to it. Like I can mm -hmm. see uh, that aspect of, or like going to an impoverished school system where I had plenty of time to just study on my own, you know, Absolutely. so I had my own grief yeah. that I would have been very hurt if someone had tried to uh, educate me, you know, yeah, 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 yeah. you know, because That's I didn't nice. need that and I needed uh, to just to grow on my own. So I wouldn't want to, you know, when I listen to you, I kind of feel like, oh, I have to critically rethink my whole life, you know, like what I've been doing. <laughs> and so, um, I guess it's always an open question, but to think, but maybe I have been going a bit on your path uh, or at least it's, you know, parallel maybe in some way. I don't know. But, but so that idea of like you identify with that, like saying. Who? To you're living in it. It's what you live in. It's like your immediate yeah. context. Maybe, yeah. Right? Like, yeah. Yeah. That if you, that before you start to pervert, well, maybe pervert's the wrong word, but before you start to kind of like, um, walk away from yourself so to speak like yeah. what is the natural context for yourself uh that you that would be the truth is that or no, how would I, you would say say, I would say existence is truth okay existence exist. is truth truth, truth, truth as existence Ex existence because beauty also i look at the same way you know mm -hmm. because i used to again conduct a workshop called being in beauty then i uh -huh. removed the be i removed the in in between in you know being in beauty to being beauty right you know so there is no in you are beauty you are truth so instead, so, of, instead of this as a mental idea existentially mm -hmm. that is what we are Other and so if I, mind, tell me tell me just to be literate about it or to label it you know as best as we can i could say truth is existence i could say truth is direct existence or is that would that be more helpful? What is a more helpful way to say it? Uh, you know, I mean, it's a yeah, crime to say these things. Cases, but... Yeah, we can stress that actually. We can stress Truth is direct, direct but existence. there is no other. Uh, you know, 
I think that it, it says that uh, that helps to it, it's the tautological, but in a in a helpful way to understand, like to, yeah. it's direct existence. It's yeah. not uh, ex yeah. not existence as a some kind of separate uh, yeah category. Let's say. Uh, yeah. Can you, okay, so you so I, I guess I felt pretty good about. It. I was shocked, like this whole truth as a landscape thing was to realize. Oh, I can grow and learn, you see, yeah, because yeah, yeah. and and study. So I'll be studying this. Um, yeah. So before we leave, I want to ask you one question. Please. Uh, I have been deeply interested in understanding how children develop mathematical concepts. Oh, okay. In the, mm -hmm. So I call it non-numeracy uh, related mathematics. These are mm -hmm. these are qualitative mathematics, not quantitative mathematics. What I mean is that uh, the body is sensing and understanding the world. Mm -hmm. It is making measurements. You know, every time it is making measurements. You know, you like something, you dislike something. That's a measurement, mm -hmm. you know. Mm -hmm. So when somebody is in the kitchen, when they are making something, it's always making measurements, but without any, uh, uh, you know, numer numerals connected to that. You don't say, you know, that this, uh, how much salt I am putting, so how much, uh, you know, spices I am putting. It's not numbered. But sensory, way, they, like for example, how a craftsman learns, no? makes things. An artisan. Well, so yeah. I can, I can, I mean, the way you, you talk about it, um, this non-numeral mathematics, like it's, uh, so I just, have been documenting these cognitive frameworks. And so there's this one rather elaborate, but um, there's actually four families of cognitive frameworks where like the mind can introspect, let's say six perspectives, but yeah. these are all have like seven, eight. So they kind of like force you to go beyond your mind, like to see there's possible, they help you go beyond yourself, transcend yourself in the ways that we were talking about where you're not trapped in literacy. So mm. like six is kind of like literacy, the, the literate mind would know six, but then there's two more. I'll, I'll make it more clear with an example. So like God has, uh, God wishes for nothing is self-sufficient, but we're not self-sufficient. We have needs. We have these reservations, like our body, we have bodies with needs. Mm. And so there's uh, six needs and this is like Maslow's hierarchy of needs, but but there's operating principles that to meet those needs, which is this mathematical nature. So like uh, the body has a need to survive. And so what we do, we cling to what we have. Okay, so one is you cling to what you have. But then uh, you want to survive tomorrow as well, right? Mm. So that's the need for security. So then you get more than what you need. Because if you have more than what you need, you know, then you can cling to, it's easier to cling to what you have because you have more, to, you know, you have something to lose, but something to cling to. And then the idea is that, well, but you'd like other people to be able to survive as well, right? So to be able to think in terms of them, that's the social need. And so to do that, you avoid extremes because um, you want to help them cling, you see. So you don't want to be at any extreme because it make it difficult for them to cling. So those are the bodily uh, needs but then our bodies extended by the psyche you know, which is also kind of like part of the body so you have this soul or mind or whatever so the survival of the psyche is self-esteem mm. and the way you get self-esteem is you choose the good over the bad mm. okay so this is the type of childish or craftsman it's like okay well this one's good this one's bad you know this car is good this car is bad this horse is good this horse is bad right so that is what boosts your self-esteem you want to have self-esteem tomorrow, so you um, choose the better over the worse. Mm. So they may be both bad, but which one is better? Right? Like, and so any type of compromise, you know, any type of negotiation, it's choosing the better over the worse. And then you want to let other people be able to choose, you know, have self-esteem. So then you want to be extreme, you see. So like you want to choose the best over the rest. So if you choose the best, then it makes it easier for other people to say, well, they agree or they don't agree. But see, these are all extremely mechanical. So if 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 this was all what life was about, we would just be robots, basically. But so when Jesus talks about like the Beatitudes or the blessings, there's different structures. Like he talks about like I am such and such. You see, there's two more things you can do. One is instead of you can get let go of your needs by taking up the needs of another. So when you worry about somebody else's needs, you see, all of a sudden you don't worry about your own needs. Mm. Uh, the thing is, though, is that's invisible. No one can see. Are you worrying about somebody else's needs or are you worrying about your own needs? You see, so it's very invisible. 
but it's loose and it doesn't change the existing system. It just transfers your focus. Mm -hmm. Now, the other is uh, what Jesus would say, like, be perfect. You see, you don't have to have needs. You could just be like, like, you could say like, you could just be wiggling your fingers in the, your toes in the mud, you know, or, or whatever it is, you know, you could just be sitting on a rock, just be relaxing, right? You don't have to have needs all the time. So those are the two that lets us transcend and not just be robotic, some kind of automata trapped in this literate world. But all of these things are surprisingly mathematical in a certain sense. They're just mathematical uh, strategies, so to speak. I don't know if that makes, that's, that rings with you, but uh, this is the type of thing I'm documenting. Does that make sense, what I'm talking about? Not much, not much. Not I much. See. Yeah. Well, the, so the, the general the idea, so we have certain needs and then we have certain ways to deal with them. Deal with it, ha, huh, huh. What part didn't make sense? I don't know. Or no, the the connection with mathematics is not something that I'm able to. Oh, the but the need part made sense, right? Yeah, all that makes sense. But how do you? Connect oh, so mathematics. With... This idea, like it's a mathematical. I think you kind of that's you kind of brought it up. You said like a child mm -hmm. will say, "This one's longer. This one's shorter." Ha, say, ha, right. Ha. Yeah. So this one's and if they just simply say, "Well, this one's better. This one's worse." Yeah, you know? yeah. That's and I don't nice know about story. children in India, but like. This kind of moralistic thinking, you know, it's pretty mm. common in games, you know, like children mm. have nothing to do. And it's it can be negative, it can be positive, it can be growing, but they have these, they, they play these games with morality. I mean, yeah, it can yeah, be cruel, yeah. you know, I, I, but I think that must be true around the world. I don't know if that's, yeah, uh, yeah, could be, yeah. you know, yeah. and so children can be super cruel um, in ways that, um, but like you say, it's temporary, I think, in certain sense. It's like experiments in cruelty, I guess, I don't know what <laughs> <laughs> you know, I mean, I, I was a child. I yeah, remember, I remember that universe. So, so like getting more than what you need—that's a mathematical concept. Avoiding extremes—that's a mathematical. Yeah, you see, these yeah. are not numerate. These are not absolutely. Numerate. Yeah, yeah. Choosing yeah, yeah, the yeah. best. You mm -hmm. see, uh, clinging to what you have. You know, it's kind of you know these are I you know this is mine. All of these are basically mathematical in some pre-mathematical sense. Is yeah. that what you were? Yeah, Is that really? yeah, okay. yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm I'm making it a little bit more literal in the sense okay. of uh, activities that has to do with uh, math act activities. You know, when you so when you jump from one place to the other, you know, for steps, for example, there are certain steps. So you're making a calculation as to if that jump is safe or not safe. I'm talking about children. Right, children right. Do these kind of things, you know. So how does the sense of number? Quantity arise in them is what I am not quality. How right. does the sense of quantity arise in them is something that I am. So why I am telling you I am I tell you why I am doing this. Mm -hmm. I want to relook at knowledge from the way children intuitively create it. Well, then it would be interesting to meet again, maybe in a month or so, and compare notes because um. I could tell you like where I would suspect, you know, at least where yeah. where these primitives in math come up because I don't know, but um, yeah, I'll give uh, just two examples where where uh, they would come up. One is let's say like a language of moods. So for example, I have this. I talk about these four families. One is needs, but see, there's another one for um, uh, emotional life. So like, mm -hmm. let's say God wishes for anything. God is calm, but we don't wish for anything. Like we have expectations, you know, we want things. And that gives rise to all this emotions, like, you know, mm -hmm. the way we expect things. I, I made this theory as a child playing with alphabet blocks, you see. Mm -hmm. And so I just said, well, I mean, thinking about that, you know, that like, if there's a block, it has a letter on one. And this is funny because it's a complete game on literacy. It's a literacy mm -hmm. game, but like mm -hmm. you have a block on top, you have a, I mean, you have a letter on top, you have a letter on the bottom. And I want to guess what's the letter on the bottom, right? Mm. Now, if these are blocks I don't know much about and I guess wrong, I'm surprised. But if I guess right, I'm excited. Mm. But if this was something I knew very well, you know, that is very dear to me, maybe my sweetheart gave me this block, or my mother gave me this block, or my father gave me something, right? And I guess wrong, I'm devastated. You know, it is existential sadness, you know, like I don't know my father, you know, what mm. he gave me, like. But if I guess right, I'm content. So those are kind of like four basic. But there's this boundary between self and world, like where the things that don't matter so much, the things that are more theoretical, they're on the other side of the boundary. I can be surprised. I can be excited. But the things on this side of the boundary, you see, uh, are the device. Now, so if I'm not able to make a uh, expectation for various reasons, it's too fast or it's something I wouldn't want to expect or whatever it is. You see, if it comes from outside, it's frightful. But if it comes from inside, it's disgusting. You see, it's okay. like, I don't want to know what is that. I don't want to know. Yeah. But um, 
So when you talk about beauty, the way that beauty comes up in this theory, it's saying, well, suppose that you have no inside and everything is outside, you see, mm -hmm. then you can't have disgust, right? Mm -hmm. Then you have what's not disgust. So then you have beauty. So beauty is kind of like the impossibility of disgust. And the idea is that beauty is like an afterglow. You see, it's not something like disgust you feel directly and it's immediate and it's a response. Mm. But beauty, you don't feel directly, oh, that was beautiful. It creeps in on you. It's just kind of like this absence of the disgust means you have this kind of glowing, you know, like this kind of like buildup of this glow, like things are just kind of like, and it's because they have all these external, everything's in terms of external relationships. There's no internal, like I don't need to be there, for example. I have no, you know, the opposite would be if there's no outside, it would be intimacy. Hmm. You see, so there's nothing you could possibly be afraid of because there's no outside. It's all intimate. And then there's a third one. All of the morally bad emotions, like you mentioned anger, they come when you they come when you expect what you do not uh, when you what you do not desire. Right. Hmm. And so, like you talked about the children, like parents never say no, you know, which is hmm. um very interesting, you know, and see, but has the consequences a lot because this, because you see, saying no basically puts you in a situation where you start to expect what you don't desire. Yeah, and that becomes very negative. So, like, you know, if if my bicycle is stolen, well, I'll be surprised. You see, but if I expect my bicycle to be stolen, right, mm -hmm. then I'll be relieved if it wasn't stolen, but I'll be angry if it was stolen. You see, but the bicycle maybe is not so important. But like if someone stole my sweetheart, right? I'll be uh, hateful if she was stolen, mm -hmm. but I'll be depressed if she wasn't stolen. So the idea is that depression is not sadness. Depression is this kind of dysfunction of my cognitive where I'm wishing things for I don't want. Then when it doesn't happen, then I just feel this, you know, de 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 incapacitated because why aren't they taking my sweetheart? What's wrong mm. with me? What's wrong with her? Right? Like, you see, I shouldn't be expecting anybody to be taking her. That's not what I want, right? Like, I, so you get stuck in this hole. So, anyway, so love is the feeling where it's impossible to have this negation. You know, like you feel that hate is impossible. You know, anger, relief, like all. I mean, all, uh, depression are all impossible because. How could anybody, because there's nothing to negate, you know, because how could I not wish for what I, you know, not expect what I wish? You see, it's in a line. So this is like this year. Now, a little bit. So the point is, okay, we have these basics, but now we have thousands of moods. You see, and no one ever is interested to try to say, like, that's the kind of thing I'm saying. Can we document this language of moods? And can we say that you have the same moods, I have the same moods, you know, under certain circumstances? So I took, as data, I took poetry. I took classic Chinese poetry, very short, very classical, very well conceived. Mm. And I said, well, this evokes moods mm. and it will evoke the same mood in you that it evokes in me because it's constructed to evoke a particular mood because that's the author's mood, right? They chose their mood as a way to write a poem that will preserve that mood. So that's a so I took 37 poems and I classified them. And what I noticed was that the mood, you know, where's the mood coming from? It's coming from changing that boundary. Hmm. So an example poem uh, would be um in Chinese. This is their most classic Chinese poem. It's called a uh, uh, quiet night thoughts. Hmm. But it said um, it goes like this: it goes, bed beyond hmm. bright moon shines. I think, I guess, I see on the ground is frost. Is? Is frost. Frost. Frost, like, you know, from the snow, you know, fro ah, frost. Ah, frost. Ah, ah. Yeah. I think on the ground is frost. I raise my head, see bright moon. I lower my head, mm. think of home. You see. So this idea, it's, the mood is, I think, conditional sadness. Like what the poem is about, it's saying, the bed is the boundary. Mm. See, the moon is beyond. Mm. And there's this geometric transformation of re inversion, like reflection. Like you take the inside of the circle and you map it to the outside or vice versa, right? The moon is beyond. Mm. I see on the ground is frost. So like this surprising thing, like the moonlight makes the ground look like it is frost, you know, that surprises from the outside. So that shows like what's the inside, what's the outside? 
I raise my head, see moon. I lower my head, I think of home. See, my home is beyond the bed. The bed is outside. Mm. I'm in my bed, but it's not my bed at home. Mm -hmm. My home is out there. Mm -hmm. So I can't feel content. I feel sad. You see, but it's a, it's the beauty and the surprise that makes me feel sad. It's a conditional sadness. You see, the more beautiful it is, and the more surprising it is, the more I feel sad. Why am I not at home? You know, so that's, you see, like I say, there's a particular mood there. I don't know if I described it well enough, but, but the idea is that you can identify that mood and I can identify that mood. And there's one mood. So when I went through all those, there's six geometric transformations. And the most important, the most basic, I thought of it was reflection, but it's really what's inversion. It mm. turns out it's not, it's not reflection across a line. It's a reflection across a circle. See, so the, the six ones are, you can have um, a rotation, like my attention can move. You can have what's called shear. So like if you take a rectangle and you make a parallelogram out of it, you know, you kind of push it. So when like I see a beautiful lady, she doesn't see me, but she thinks about her love who jilted her, you know, etc. There's this kind of like parallelogram shift, like it's like a shear. Uh, there's a dilation, like we're like I climbing a tower. So like my view becomes larger, let's say, right? Or it can become smaller, changing the area. There could be squeeze. So like I take a rectangle shape like this and I change, it's the same area, but I change the proportions. So like it's a song about, let's say, uh, a, a woman, she married this merchant, you know, so he's wealthy, but he's never at home. But if she would have married a poor commoner, you know, but he would be at home, you know, and things like that, like this kind of squeeze palm. And then the last one's translation. So like, you know, you're moving from, you know, getting closer to home or wherever you are, you're moving. So it turns out all the poems play with the boundary in this way. And those are six. And it turns out in math, there's this thing called the Mobius transformation. So like if you look at the complex numbers, you add a point at infinity, you get like a sphere, so to speak. And the Mobius transformations are like if you have a circle on a sphere, all the possible ways to go from a circle to another circle. So what it suggests, it suggests that in the mind, you see, there's this uh, calculus like, you know, we have a model of the world as a sphere and inside we're like a circle and that circle has the boundary and then the boundary can you know change to another circle etc it's a very simple model you see and so this is completely something like the scientific academy would not be interested in just because it's just too you know outrageous let's say but i'm saying like it's a wonderful uh that's the kind of thing i'm looking for mm -hmm. and so when children, like this idea of these boundaries, you see, like, you, how do you translate something? How do you change the shape, you know, square? Like, these are natural things. They're not really numerate in a certain sense, but they're all geometric. This is where the origins of geometry, these six transformations. Uh, so that would be one. And then the other um, is um, I made a study of the ways of figuring things out. I started with my own philosophy, but then I did it for dis different disciplines, like, for example, mathematics. And there's always 24 ways. So you get these, this structure of 24 ways. But it could be like, you know, well, you need to find the center. You know, the correct center will solve the problem. Or you need to balance things. Let's say that, you know, like you, you multiply by one. One is the numerator and denominator, let's say, right? So they have to balance. If you multiply by one, it'll solve the problem. Or add by zero, you know, positive and negative, you know, quantities, you know. Or then you can have sets of, let's say, roots of a polynomial, or you could have, let's say, a list of vectors, things. But this is the kind of thing where, um, like the, the example I give, basically, I made a video about this. And people are interested in this type of thing. Um, uh, but um, among all the stuff I do, this is the one that gets viewers. But So this idea about the deep structure, surface structure. So in Euclid's book, the number one, the first problem is like, how do you draw an equilateral triangle? If I have an edge, how do I make an equilateral triangle? And so the answer with a ruler and compass, let's say, right? And so the answer is like, well, you take one edge and you take the compass, you make one circle and you look at the other point, you make another circle with the same compass and then they'll meet at uh, two points, let's say. So you get, you draw the equilateral triangle. Now the question is, how do they figure it out? You see, and the idea is that in order to figure this out, you need to think in terms of conditions that to have the equilateral triangle, there's one condition is that it needs to, you know, that the point will need to be this length away from one point and this length away from another point is the second condition. So each circle is a condition and the satisfactory, so you're looking for where you have both conditions met. 
you see? So you have, mathematically speaking, what's really solving the problem is you have a lattice of conditions. You know, you have no conditions, you have condition A, condition B, and then both conditions. And it's a tiny little diamond, you see, that you're manipulating. That's an algebra of conditions. The, the geometry of the triangles really don't matter in solving this problem. They're absolutely not really. What, what matters is as soon as you realize that this is a problem about conditions, then you solve it. And if you don't realize that, you won't solve it, you see? Mm -hmm. So that's like one of the 24 ways is to say there's a... And so like that type of thing, like you're saying, well, I think like maybe this is maybe similar to the one you said, like, you know, I want to cross the river. How many conditions do I have to meet to cross, right? Like this rock, this rock. So you don't have to count them, but you have to be able to say, you know, like, so there's, that would be like the kind of way to, um, that'd be the way that they're figuring that out would be exactly the kind of way that people are figuring out things in advanced mathematics, because there's only 24 ways. This is non-literate mathematics. You see, this is the mathematics, non-axiomatic. Uh, uh, this is the mathematics that we're like born with uh, because that's, a, but in any field, you basically get the same 24 ways. It is a, so I don't know if this type of thing is kind of interesting to you, but like to try to share notes on a language because you know, you have certain data and you have certain ideas and you have certain, you know, observations. And I have, I'm coming from a different direction. So not to do each other's work, yeah, but to try to find uh, common points, I don't know if that would be interesting to you. Yeah, we can do that. So maybe, uh, well, I don't want to include you too much in this digital world, but so you know, we could meet maybe in a month or so sure. by Zoom. Yeah, and then um, if you're interested more, uh, like I mean, I have I don't know if you want to watch videos, but so I'm, I'm I have videos that I'm creating. But the other thing is that I have a dis discussion group. Um, with email, like, you know, where we have a few emails a day, maybe right now it's maybe like one or two a day. I don't know if you'd want to join that, but I could send you the link for that. Yeah. And then I can, then I can could... come in and see if that interests me. I will stay. Otherwise I will. Yeah. Or you can leave. Right. Yeah. Yeah. And then you can uh, introduce yourself and maybe write. Uh, well, I think maybe to have this, um, to have this, uh, video uh, available. So why don't I publish this in two parts? The first part would be your vision for our future. Yeah, yeah. And then the second part would be like a kind of like a, a bridging of the minds. Sure. That we, where we both yeah. talk. Is that fine? Yeah, yeah, that's good. That's good. Okay, we took too long. My <laughs> first time already. So thank you for this long conversation. And then I, I guess we could say goodbye probably now, right? Or... Yeah, yeah. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you. Goodbye. Uh, yeah, yeah. Thank you for watching this video. Please uh, go to mathforwisdom.com or simply read the description to this video to learn how you can join our Math for Wisdom discussion group and our study groups. Thank you for liking this video, for subscribing to this YouTube channel, and for supporting Math for Wisdom through Patreon. I think you should be a Patreon supporter of Math for Wisdom it's really easy. It takes five minutes and Math for Wisdom is expanding. It, it, it will expand your horizons in many ways. Just go to Patreon and sign up, it's that easy.